Hello and welcome to a bonus Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode number 142.2, Building Civilizations and Theme Parks. I'm Sean, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. We record live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. And every now and then we do something weird, like record on a Thursday and just watch our social media and find out when that happens. So welcome to a bonus episode of our podcast. Now, after we recorded our three-year anniversary episode last night, things went on a little bit longer than we expected. Um, The full recording time was four hours plus. So while we had planned on recording a couple of reviews separately and then throwing them into the middle of that episode... I don't think anyone wants to listen to us for three plus hours straight. So instead, we decided to record this special review focused episode where we'll be sharing our thoughts on Tapestry from Stonemaier Games and Unfair from Good Games Publishing, with plenty of comparison to Funfair to toss into the mix. Before we get to those reviews, I just want to remind everyone that our next giveaway is live over on the blog. This time I'm offering up a copy of Watergate from Capstone Games, and I'm going to toss in the Meeple Realty insert for the game as well. Note the game is in great shape, but has been played long enough to give it a review. The insert, on the other hand, is still sealed in Mm -hmm. shrink wrap. Now, this contest is open to anyone who lives in the U.S. and Canada and will close at the end of the day on the 25th of August. Also, a quick invitation for everyone to join us for Sunday Brunch with the Bellhop live here on Twitch, Sundays at 1 p.m. Eastern. Yeah, that's our unscripted show that we've started doing where we spend a lot of time interacting with the chat room, our lobby here on Twitch, and the two of us chat about whatever happens to catch our interest that previous week. Hello and welcome to our review of Tapestry a civilization-building game from Stonemeyer Games. And while I know he won't listen to this, thanks, Jamie, for letting us pick up a review copy of your game. So Tapestry was designed by Jamie Stegmeyer. It features artwork by Andrew Bosley and sculptures by Ron Brown. It was published in North America by Stonemeyer Games in 2019. Now, a game of Tapestry plays one to five players, with games taking around two hours on average, though it is dependent on the player count and player experience. Now, I will have to say Tapestry is not cheap. It has a manufactured suggested retail price of $99 US. Though once you see the quality of the components used in this game, that price becomes much more palatable. This is a game that has a real amazing table presence and not in a flashy draw attention way Mm -hmm. we often talk about when playing in public, but it really feels impressive to those playing it. And the components are a strong part of the value in this game, but that's not to ignore the massive replayability you get in this box. Totally agree. Now, Tapestry is a civilization building board game featuring only two actions each round available for each player. You either collect income and enter the next era for your evolving civilization, or you move up on one of four progress tracks, which include exploration, technology, science, or military. Now, moving up these tracks is what makes the game interesting, and by doing so, you'll do all kinds of things like expanding your civilization, conquering territories on the map, inventing technologies, completing research, building your capital city, and more. Now, This game features some of the best components that we've seen in a board game, so you Mm -hmm. should really see this for yourself in our Tapestry, the unboxing video on YouTube. Now, there is a ton of stuff in this box. All of it, honestly, was better quality than I expected. Like, I knew this game was well-produced. Everyone's probably heard just how impressive Tapestry looks. I saw all the hype about just how impressive it was myself, but I was still surprised by many elements I hadn't heard about. Like everyone's heard about the 3D buildings, right? Everyone's seen the 3D buildings, everyone's seen the pictures, but there's more to it than that. Things like the fact the game has a box insert with a lid to hold those three-dimensional landmarks to make sure they don't get damaged. The other part is those landmarks are not pre-painted, they're actually printed in multiple colors. The way all the player boards are actually textured, they kind of feel like a low grit sandpaper, and that's to prevent things from sliding around on them. A good alternative to a double-sided board, which would have cost way more. The quality of all the buildings on the individual player houses 
are really cool. And the outposts aren't just cubes. Um, even the material the rule book is printed on is a step above what you'd expect in a modern board game. All right, well, how will you tell us what we do with all these fancy components? All right, so learning to play tapestry can be kind of interesting. The actual rule book for this game is four pages long. Literally, that's it, four pages, and they're not like really small font. Now, the reason for that is the actual rules are very simple. Each term, you have two choices. It's the implementation of those choices that can lead to the complexity and weight of this game. Well, even though we've talked about struggling with the Tabletopia implementation hmm. of the game, that had nothing to do with the difficulty of the game play or the rules. That was right. the easy part. True. Now, you start a game by putting the board on the table. It's got two sides. You use whichever side's appropriate for your player count. Everyone's going to take a player board and fill it up with the various building types. So there's four different building types, markets, houses, farms, and armories. You put them on different tracks. And then you're going to grab four resource tokers, trackers, tokers? trackers one for food money culture and one for workers you put those all at zero players are then dealt two random civilizations which are these big cards and then one or two capital city mats uh that's based on the number of players if you're playing with four or five players you just get one if you're playing with less you actually get a pick between each each between two uh two of your outposts are placed onto your starting island Tracking cubes are placed at the start of each of those progress tracks i mentioned and at the start of the victory point check now you're going to shuffle the cards that come in the game. You have tech cards and tapestry cards. You're going to put those face down by the board. And you're going to deal out three tech cards to a market. Now, the rest of the materials like exploration tiles, space tiles, landmark boards and landmarks and everything are just put beside the board, kind of set up so it's in reach of everyone. So there is a good deal of setup in this, but it pays off. And there's enough mm. game here so that you're not annoyed by spending a long time setting up relative to the time you spend playing Next, players are going to adjust their starting materials based on the civilization they chose. Also, be sure to check the civilization advancement sheet for any changes that are made to that civilization since the game was published. Now, this is something that's been added to the game since it came out. There will be a copy in your copy of the game if you pick it up now, and you can always go online to check for the most updated version. Now, the current version was last updated in March 2021. That's of today on August 5th. Now, this is something that can't be ignored. Check online. This is, albeit in a minor way, a living game. Yes. Now, you got everything set up. On your turn, each player is going to do one of two things. I mentioned this a few times. Those two things are collect income or advance. So income or advance, pick one or the other. Since no one has any resources at the start of the turn, start of the game, you're going to start by taking an income turn. So I'm going to describe that one first. So each income turn, you go through four steps. First, you're going to look at your civilization board and activate any during your income phase abilities. These are widely varied. I'm not going to get into what they do. Note you skip this turn one. Next, you're going to take a tapestry card and you're going to put it down in the next era. Now, if you don't have one in your hand, you're going to draw a random one. Now, if you are the first of your neighbors to do this, you get a bonus because you're the first civilization that's getting into the next era and you get a bonus for doing this now note again this is skip turn one you automatically everyone develops fire the first civilization turn okay so i think listeners might appreciate a bit of clarity here what exactly yeah. is a tapestry card so this ties into the theme of the game these are what was written about your civilization at that time it's what was woven into the tapestry that's the history of your civilization and there's a variety of different cards and they all are going to give you either an instant bonus where right now you get a thing or they're going to put an effect into play for the entire era there are tons of these there's a significant deck an example is dictatorship you pick one of the four tracks you go up on it once and get the bonus no one else can go up on that track until your next turn that's one of them Another one is called the trap card. Now you can play that as a tapestry card and get 10 points, which is a huge bonus, or you can hold on to it and you can reveal it if someone attacks you and you end up defeating them instead of you them defeating you. And there are a ton of these. There, there's diplomacy, there's uh, revolution, there's exploitation. There are a ton of tapestry cards. Next, you will upgrade one of your technology cards and gain victory points. So what you're going to do is take any of your technology cards, you're going to move it up one level, they're placed on the side of your board, and gain the appropriate reward. Now, each tech card can only be advanced twice. 
We'll get into how you get those in a minute. Now, victory points are gained based on what is currently showing on your player board, which again will be nothing at the start of your games. Everything's covered up. Think of games like Terra Mystica or Clans of Caledonia, where you're uncovering things on your board to see what your income is. Later, points are going to be earned for things like the number of technology cards you have, having complete rows and columns of buildings on your capital map, advancing on the farm track, and controlling territories on the board. Now, these scoring opportunities are unlocked by getting your buildings into play from your player mat into your capital city. The next thing you're going to do is collect income. Again, there are four resources in the game, money, food, workers, and culture. Each income phase, you'll gain a number of each based on, again, how many income symbols are showing on your player board, which, again, are unlocked by playing buildings from your player board onto your mat. So certainly simple enough, not a huge number of differing resources or options to really muddy the waters right. in your discussions. Now, your first income phase of the first turn is going to be really basic. You're just going to collect one of every resource, one trap is to your card, and one exploration token, and that's it. Unless your civilization modifies that in some way. Every future one, though, is going to be a big kind of involved process. Now, instead of doing an income phase, you can instead choose the advance action. What you're doing here is you're going to choose one of the four tracks on the board, one of the four progress tracks of warfare, exploration, technology, or science, pay the cost and resources for the next spot on that track, move your cube, your tracking cube to the next spot, and then take the action indicated there. Then you'll have the option to complete any bonus actions that are on that spot. Now, this is where things get interesting with all kinds of options, like way too much for me to cover here. Each track has 12 different spots on it, each of which is totally unique. Now, some are similar, especially earlier on the track, like take a tapestry card and optionally build a building. That's on all four of the tracks, actually, usually in the third spot, see the second or third spot. But most of the actions other than those are completely different. And some have options like build a building or conquer. Some are build a building and conquer and so on. Now, what I will do here is I'll talk in general about each of the track types and the types of actions they provide, but there's nowhere I'm going to describe every action in the game. And I do have to thank Jamie for including a sheet that summarizes all of this in one place. Now, to be clear, while we can't discuss them all, that's because of sheer volume, yeah. not the complexity. You'll become quite familiar with the iconography quickly, and those reference sheets we'll mention are there to help. And once you've got some strategy ideas in mind, you'll often find less trouble than you think making a choice and deciding where you're going to be going. The other thing I do appreciate about these tracks is for teaching the game, as long as you don't have a hardcore player that wants to win their first game, you can just generally tell them what the next step is on every track, every turn. So now you're here, here, and here. Here's what the next step is here. Here's what the next step here and there and there. And then the next turn, you just tell them what new one they've reached. That way you don't have to explain the entire game from the start of it. So starting with the exploration track, this is about building farms, collecting exploration tiles, and expanding the game map. Now, the one of the most common actions on this track is the explore action that will let you place one of those tiles onto the board and grow the map. You're going to get bonus points for doing this based on how well it matches up to the tiles that are already there, and you're going to get some form of resource for placing the tile. Now, this is usually one of the four resources, but could be the ability to build a building excuse me, the ability to build a building or gain a tapestry card or level up a technology. Now, the technology track, this is all about building markets and inventing technologies. Now, when you invent a technology, you place it next to your capital city map. It does nothing for you until you're able to advance it, and you don't get to advance technologies in general until the income phase, though there are spots further down the technology track that will let you advance them during a normal turn. Now, each technology contains two rewards. One you get after advancing it the first time, and another one that's only earned if you advance the same tech again. Now, for that highest level, they call it in squares. To do that, there's always also a requirement. This is going to be based on either how many buildings you or your neighbors have built, or how far you or your neighbors are up on different progress tracks. Now, I've mentioned neighbors a couple times, but that actually means it's the player to your left and right. So similar to games like Seven Wonders, you're more worried about what the players to your left and right are doing compared to players across from you. Now, the next track is the military track. This is all about building armories and, of course, conquering territory. Now, to conquer a territory is really simple. This isn't like any complex war game. You just take one of your outposts and put it on a tile adjacent to one you control. You then roll the military dice and pick a reward. 
Now, if there is an enemy outpost there, you topple it. You just set it on its side. Now, each tile can only ever hold two outposts, so there can only ever be one fight in each hex on the board. And again, it's not even really a fight. You just win. If you conquer, you do it. Unless someone has one of those trap cards I mentioned earlier. Finally, we have the science track. This one is huge, interesting because, for one, you'll be placing houses. But more than that is you are going to get to roll this science die. And what that does is advance you on one of these four tracks randomly between the four of them. Now, when you first start advancing on science, you're going to get to go up on a track for free, but you don't get the reward for doing so. But as you get further down the science track, you're going to get to start to roll that die and be able to get the bonuses or advance on multiple tracks claiming all the rewards. If you get up high enough on the science track, there's even a spot that lets you turn back time. All right, so just because we've seen a lot of people talking about how this isn't a Civ game, we can reiterate exploration, technology, military, income. I think the only thing may, may be missing is, I don't know, building a capital city? Well, see, when you advance on these tracks, you're also going to get the opportunity to build buildings. Uh, as I mentioned, when you're doing the different ones, you get to build different types of buildings, like exploration, you build farms, the technology track, you build markets, the military track, you build armies, armories, and the science track, you're building houses. What this actually means when you're playing is you're going to take a building from your player board and put it on your capital city map. Now, not only does this let you fill up your capital city map, which is important for scoring, but it also uncovers those spots on your player board, leading to more income and more scoring abilities. Now, you can also grow your capital city map from the advancement of certain technology cards and by collecting landmarks. Now, each of the four tracks on the board is broken up into three sections for each. The first player to advance to like level two in a section gets a free building. The first person to advance to level three on that track will get a free building. And the first person to advance to level four will get a free building. These are large buildings. They take up a minimum of a two by two area on your grid up to a total of, I think one is like four by two by three. There are some huge buildings here. This tends to be great for filling in your mat which is good for completing rows and columns for victory points, as well as filling in three by three areas, which gives you free resources. So there we go. Not only a city, but a, Soku, a Sudoku reminiscent aspect to building it in stages. Yes. Now, additionally, victory points can also by, be earned by completing three achievements that are always in play. Uh, one is getting to the end of the progress tracks, first person to get to an end of a progress track, then second person to get to an end of a progress track, and possibly third, depending on how many players you're playing with. Conquering the center of the map is worth points for the first person there and then the second. I get, no third person could go there because the whole rules with the outposts. Speaking of toppling outposts, there's also one for the first person to topple two opponents' outposts and for the second person to do so. The game continues with each player going income or advance until everyone has collected income five times. Now, it's interesting to note that players don't have to take income at the same time. One player's civilization could be in era number one still, while someone else is in era three. And this is by design and intentional. The choice of when to take income and advance to the next era is an important part of the strategy and tapestry. And it's also possible for players to be done playing while other players still need to finish up. One thing this game really allows is, in a meta sense, telling strange stories of development with some civilizations mm -hmm. surging forward, others languishing, tales of battles and technology paths far different than what we are used to on a more linear games stuck in how things have happened here on Earth. Now, once all players have taken their fifth income action, the game ends, the player with the most points wins. To me, that's shocking because most Euro games then have some kind of scoring phase or something. There's nothing. You don't get anything at the end. Once you've done your fifth income, that's your score. Sits there at the end of the game. There's just no end game scoring. Though players can still earn a significant portion of their points in that last income phase. There's usually a rather large surge. And most people I played it with are like, oh, there's no way anyone's getting 100 points. And then they play a game where they get 300 because it does ramp up. Yeah, planning for that end game should start early and will be part of what guides your selections and your path through the game, of course, based on the civilization that you started with. Mm -hmm. Now, in addition to these multiplayer rules, the game also includes a solo variant, which uses two bots, and then another variant where you can use one of those two bots in a two-player game. 
Now, both bots use an interesting card-based action system to determine what tracks they advance on and when they do advance, what they advance on. The automata, automa, at, automa, I don't know how the proper way it's, it's not automata, it's automa or automa, automa. Automa, I would guess. Probably automa. So the automa bot acts as an opponent for solo play. It fe features a very simplified action system. Each round, it's going to go up one track. It's going to claim any landmarks it earns, and then it's going to take that action. But only certain actions will the bot do, which includes conquering, exploring, rolling the science die, clearing the tech cards, and collecting tapestry cards. All other actions, building buildings, all that skip. They don't do that. Now, in each income phase, the Atoma scores points for the number of landmarks it's collected, the territory it controls on the board, and how far it's progressed up each track. So it will be interesting to see if licensed digital versions of the game merge, since the bot play seems to really lend itself to mechanization. Mm -hmm. I could see this going very well, for instance, on BGA. See, we tried it on BGA. I have no idea if there was a solo mode integrated on there or not. Oh, well, we tried it worth a on Tabletopia, you mean. Oh, sorry, Tabletopia. Yeah. I always, sorry, yes. <laughs> Would go really well on Burgame Ring. Now, the other bot is the, called the Shadow Empire. It's kind of there just to make things happen that might not otherwise. So each turn, this bot progresses up one track. It is still going to collect landmark buildings. So basically, it can steal buildings from players. It can also claim the reach the end of the track achievement, but doesn't get any points for it. So the Shadow Empire actually can't score points and can't win the game. Now, in solo games, the Shadow Empire's outpost can end up on the board, but that's just part of how the Atoma conquers. I, it, you can't win. So even when playing solo, it's either you or Atoma win, and if playing two-player with the Shadow Empire, a human always wins. Well, now that we have a good idea of how to play Tapestry, how about we get into some of your opinions on the game? All right, let's start with for some reason seems to be the problem everyone has with this game. There was a huge media blitz when Tapestry hit the market back in 2019. This is one of the few games where they actually had people hold back their reviews and release them all on the same day. And that day, I'm sorry to say that all of the news was not positive. Well, everyone seemed to love the components. Everyone was hyped by how cool the game looked. The gameplay turned off a number of people and a big part of this were people claiming that Tapestry is not a civilization game. This is an opinion, I, I don't understand it. I really don't. Like, obviously, when people hear the term civilization game, they must get some idea in their head about what to expect. What is a civ game to them? I'm assuming these ideas are driven by the original Amazon, Amazon? Avalon Hill civilization game, which the popular video game everyone knows and loves, Sid Saxon. Sid, Sid, I can't even talk now. Sid, it's not even Sid Saxon. Sid but Myers. Sid Myers. Thank you. Wow. Sorry. <laughs> Ideas that are driven by the original Avalon Hill civilization game, which the popular video game is based on, or more modern civilization building games like Clash of Cultures or Through the Ages or the new version of Through the Ages, whatever that one's called. Um, people seem to expect that the game will play like those games and follow a timeline that's similar to the one we went through, like what humanity did in real life. The thing is, Tapestry doesn't do either of these. It doesn't try to recreate those games, and it doesn't follow our existing timeline. It's a different kind of civilization game. It's an anachronistic one. In this game, you're leading a civilization, one that can evolve into something more over time, you're going to be inventing technologies and improving them. You're progressing on four different tracks representing the key civ building elements of exploration, science, technology, and warfare. You build up your capital city and in so doing, complete developments that will increase your income and your ability to generate more points and resources. You're going to expand your territory by exploring and conquering. You're going to conquer the territory held by other players. You can exploit territories and play for resources. Like to me, these are all the staples of civilization games. It's just being done in a new and interesting way. Yeah, While I, moving a brown building from your player board to your gridded capital city Sudoku light board might be what you're doing mechanically. Thematically, this represents the development of farming and the growing value of your capital. Yes, this game your civilization that just developed fire 
may take the transistor technology card. But as I said, this game's anachronistic. It's not meant to represent any current civilization's progress through history, but rather a variant one. Plus, to be honest, taking a tech card to me always just seemed to indicate your society was thinking about that thing. Like, no, your cavemen aren't thinking about transistors, but maybe they've dug up the appropriate metals that will eventually develop into transistor technologies. The, the first step is just the, the basic thoughts of it. It takes advancing a tech to actually get the benefits. And honestly, for those transistors, I don't think you get them until you hit that fourth stage, which requires someone in the game to hit level four in technology before you can do it, which to me makes sense. Yeah, no, I, I just, I don't understand the confusion. It, it's a 4X game. Yeah. <laughs> if a 4X game isn't a Civ game, I don't know what is. <laughs> I, I honestly, I, I'm i still baffled. I saw someone say it today. I shared a picture of Tapestry on my Twitter account today, and someone came in with the, just didn't feel like a Civ game to me. And I'm like, well, what is a Civ game to you? Like, we may have to do an entire topic on our podcast about what is a Civ game, just so we can talk about it. And I'd love to hear other people's opinions to explain why this isn't fun. So let's throw out a whoop. Let's forget it. Let's don't don't. It's not a Civ game for the rest of the review. Whatever you whatever makes you happy. We're going to toss that out and take a look at the game on its own merits. So ever since our first game, I have had a lot of fun discovering Tapestry. And that's what Tapestry feels like every time I play it is a journey of discovery. I'm always trying different things. I'm experiencing different civilizations. I'm figuring out which tracks work best with the others and what pairs work. I'm discovering which technologies synchronize with what strategies. I'm learning just how important filling your capital city can be and how much that can mean and so much more. And there's really such a variance between civilizations, which is, as we discussed earlier, part of why this is a living game. Uh, they are adjusting things as they go to balance mm. the civilizations, but you can play a very different game depending on who you're starting as. Yes. I'm also really impressed by how Jamie was able to distill the mechanics of a big, pretty complicated game to four pages. But to be honest, it's that simple. Gain income and enter the next stage or progress on one of the four tracks. That's it. That's all you need to know. Now, the decision of what track to advance, when to advance on it, how far to advance, when you should take income, and all of that is what gives this game its weight and complexity. And added to these is the complexity of having to look at what your opponents are doing and react based on that. Well, the basic options are simple. It's what to do with them there's not. There are a ridiculous number of ways you can play this game. And so far, we have found a number of very valid strategies getting you to real um, victory points. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the difference between writers and RPG writers designing a manual versus a board game designer who has designed a nice tight game, yeah. writing the manual of this is how you play. Figure out the rest in, as you play. Yeah, in a way. Now, I will admit that there's kind of a cheat here, like the rule book's four pages, but then there are multiple sheets to reference to find out what some of the things do. I would actually say that the the, pay, the, the rule book is actually six pages, because I think you have to count those two reference pages as part of the rules of the game, because you'll never figure it out otherwise. But yeah, I, but even that, six pages, like this, if this was a fantasy flight game, I'd expect 34 pages to try to explain all of this stuff, explaining what every different little box does. Now, added to this, in the base game, oh, I might have this wrong. I think I checked it. I, I, this may be with the expansion. I apologize. I think this is right. There are 16 different civilizations presented in the game. Now, with five players playing, that gives you 4,368 different possible starting civilization combinations. Now, that's a huge number. Now, added to that, there are multiple ways in the game to add a civilization to one of the players. So once you throw that in, that number just grows exponentially. Due to this, like, that's great that this variation is awesome, right? Like, it, it, it's, it, it's very cool that there's that many combinations. But the problem is, there is no way no one possibly could try every possible combination. And because of that, the civilizations aren't perfectly balanced. Not even close, I would say. Now, to address this, Jamie has created that civilization adjustment document I mentioned earlier which seems to do a pretty good job of fixing any serious balance issues. Uh, 
Now, this doesn't actually do the nice thing where, like, if you're playing this sieve versus this sieve, change it. Everything's kept generic, so it's simple. Like, you start the game and just take some extra points or take an extra resource or ignore this ability the first turn, that kind of stuff. Now, this is a living document, too, and this has been updated three times so far. And as more people play Tapestry and let people know, let Jamie know how it's gone, I expect this document to change. Now, to help with this, after a game of Tapestry, you can go to Stonemeyer's website and log your play. And I highly recommend that everyone playing do this because it benefits all of us who enjoy the game, as well as potentially improving the game for anyone new to it. Now, one thing that's really interesting is the sheer number of combinations here mean that it's really difficult to become an expert in the game. Mm -hmm. Some of those players who just want to be, you know, find that ideal strategy not only may be thwarted by the Living Up rules update, but also may be thwarted by the fact that their opponents aren't choosing civilizations that they're used to playing with, thus changing mm -hmm. the entire layout of how people are going to play things because mm -hmm. I learned how to play with civilization X and I can always beat civilizations A and B. But if I'm playing civilization X and they're playing civilizations Q and Y, it's a whole different game. So you, you, you lose the, you lose the ability to kind of uh, force, force people into, into situations because they just would never play that way with a given civilization. And each civilization makes the game so asymmetric that I don't think there's an overall tapestry strategy that you can use with every civilization. And if there is, someone may have discovered it, but I'm not seeing that at all. It, you, you have to change how you are playing based on the ability you're given with your civilization. Moving on, as already mentioned, production quality is top notch. Um, I love how tactile everything is. Like this game not only looks good, it, it honestly feels good. Um, I could say more, but honestly, the physicality of this game has been covered by pretty much every reviewer out there and people who own copies of the game and everyone who's got an Instagram account who has played this. So I think we've, we've probably heard enough about the actual tactileness and the production quality. And uh, unfortunately, I still haven't had my hands on it. That'll be uh, in a week or so. Soon, soon. Now, another thing that I really like here is Tapestry is one of those games along with some of my other favorites, like Terraforming Mars, where at the end of the game, I feel like I built something. I accomplished something. I built something from the ground up. To me, that feeling is more rewarding than, and more important than winning a game. These are the type of games that have me coming back for more. That's why Terraforming Mars was my most played game from last year. I love playing that game just to see, oh, this time I went with this and I did this and I managed to win with this or I managed to not put a tile on the board or I did this thing. And Tapestry does that as well. Like score-wise, to be honest, I am terrible at this game. I have come dead last every time I played, except for that I did kind of beat out deep playing against the Atoma, but we each had different civilizations, so who knows? But yeah, I I'm, seem to be terrible at the game, but I have enjoyed playing every single time. Excellent. And I, I had a, I had fun with the one digital play, uh, at least in concept. Again, we struggled with the, uh, the interface, but I liked the game enough to know that I want to sit down mm -hmm. and play the game for real. Now, the other thing I will say is I have enjoyed this game at every player count, uh, though I will say five is a bit longer than I would have liked. Um, there's a lot of downtime between turns. Uh, AP can also be an issue. Um, the other thing is the, the full player count also increases the odds that one or more players is going to finish playing before the others and have to wait out till the end, which honestly, like anytime we've had it, it was like one or two more rounds. It wasn't a big wait, but because it does have player elimination, the more players, the more chance someone might be kind of sitting watching till the end. Right. Now tapestry players on board game geek claim this game is best at three. And honestly, I disagree with that. I liked it the most at four. And the reason for that are the neighbor rules. I mentioned before neighbor rules come up when taking income, uh, moving to the next era, and when trying to advance your technologies to that third level. With three or fewer players, everyone's your opponent and your neighbor. But once you get to four or five, there's going to be one or two other players who, while still your opponents, aren't your neighbors, and I like that interaction. There's just something I liked about that that made it feel good that I didn't have to worry about what you were doing, and I had to watch what they were doing. And then I'd see, like, oh, you advanced 
which means she's probably going to advance next. So I might want to advance before she does. I just, I liked the, 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 the thought process that went into that. Yeah, but you don't get to the full level of Seven Wonders where no. you're struggling to pay attention with some what everyone at the table is doing, but it just becomes pointless to look at what the player <laughs> way over there is doing. Yeah, Seven Wonders, the only thing I ever bothered tracking is technologies. That's the only one. Other than that, I don't pay any attention to anyone but my neighbors. And only if I'm trying to collect technologies. I did not have that problem at all here. The one that shocked me is how well this game played two players. Um, I honestly cannot think of another 4X style game that plays this well at two. Like we tried Eclipse with two and it was okay, but it wasn't great. And that was without using the Shadow Empire bot, which could improve a two player game. Because what it does is it's something else in play that will snatch up landmarks before the players basically split them evenly. When we played two players, I will admit it was like, I'm going to go up these two tracks. You're going to go up those two tracks. And we kind of ignored each other instead of being in direct conflict. But it did work. I was even more surprised how much I actually enjoyed playing this game solo. I am definitely not a big solo board gamer, but it was quite fun on my own. And I actually think playing solo might be a great way to explore the different civilizations. Like just to improve your overall gameplay, sit down and play solo against Atoma and the Shadow Empire and try each of the different civilizations. Though there are some they don't recommend using in that particular format interesting that they give you that that flexibility so that while no we as we've said you're not going to gain system mastery you can get more comfort you know find mm -hmm. find the civilization that you are more comfortable with yeah and to be honest by the rules you're supposed to give them out randomly but there's no reason not to give sean his favorite civ every time he plays unless he wins every time and then <laughs> i'd still want to give it to him and try to beat him so overall i think it's pretty obvious so far in the review uh we dig tapestry Everyone we've taught this game to has enjoyed it as well. Uh, we have one Fred considering it one of their favorite board games of all time. I've enjoyed every single play of Tapestry, both with new and experienced players so far. No, experienced players aren't people who have played 20 times. That's We're still in the middle of a bit of a pandemic here. So I haven't gotten to play with any Tapestry experts, but everyone we played with has had a fun and I've enjoyed playing with them. It's got amazing production quality and it features gameplay that leaves you feeling like you accomplished something whether you win or lose, which I think is a huge feature of this game. Now, if you dig 4X style games that feature things like progressing on tracks, exploring, conquering, and developing technologies with variable player powers and asymmetry, you're going to love Tapestry. Just leave any preconceived notions about what's a sim building game, what isn't at the door, sit down and enjoy the game. Now, one big advantage Tapestry does have over popular sim building games is it's much shorter. Even at five players with experienced players, you should be able to finish a game in under two hours. And it's much less complex than most big, heavy, long, epic sim games with a weight of only 2.88 on Board Game Geek. So due to this, even if epic 4X game nights kind of scare you, you might want to give Tapestry a try because it's a distilled version, shorter experience. Now, if you are out there looking for the next big Civ game, the next Clash of Cultures, the new Through the Ages, the new Sid Meier Civilization 12, you're not going to find that here. Tapestry is a very different type of civilization game. Now, I do still recommend giving it a shot, but don't go in expecting the same experience you've had with other Civ builders. Well, that's it for our review of Tapestry. I invite you to also check out Mo's written review over on the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. Welcome to our look at Unfair, a theme park building game with some nasty elements. A big thank you to Good Games Publishing for providing us with a review copy of this game. Unfair was designed by Joel Finch, who also did the graphic design. It features development by Kim Brebick and Kate Finch and artwork from Nicole Castles, Lena Cassette, Dave Forrest, and Philippe Poirier. Game was originally funded on Kickstarter and published in 2017 by Good Games Publishing and Simon, now just published by Good Games Publishing. Unfair has an MSRP of $49.99 US dollars. Now, a game of Unfair can be played with two to five players, with Board Game Geek users recommending four as the best player count, and I can't say I disagree with that. Now, a game of Unfair takes an hour or two, depending on the player count, the amount of AP, analysis paralysis, and which Game Changer cards you choose to use. And the Game Changers are only one of the great ways that this game has a huge replayability factor. 
Now, in the unfair, players take on the role of competing theme park owners, each trying to build the most successful theme park. You'll combine decks featuring cool park themes like pirate, robot, gangster, and vampire to make each game unique. Players will add attractions to their parks and improve on them with upgrades while trying to get their parks to conform to the specifics of high-scoring blueprints. Remember, though, this is unfair, and it's not all fun and games. You'll have to deal with unfair city events like wear and tear that can close your rides and your competitors being nasty by doing things like paying off the safety inspectors to shut down parts of your park or hiring hooligans to vandalize your best rides. Note, if you are looking into this game for the first time, I strongly suggest you pause and instead check out Funfair, also mm -hmm. from Good Games Publishing. Despite being released after Unfair, Funfair is a great gateway game to this card-based park building system. It's shorter, easier to learn, and a more family-friendly game that removes all of the take that and nastiness from the game. You can check out our Funfair review on the blog, on YouTube, or as part of episode 120, Engine Building. Now, getting back to Unfair, for a look at what you get in the box for this somewhat nasty theme park building game, check out our unboxing video on YouTube. Now, I go into a lot more detail on the components of this game over on the blog review. For this show, though, I'm just going to say I was impressed by most of what you got here, almost everything. There's one of the best written rule books I've ever read that makes learning the game a breeze. There are lots of cards at a good quality already split into the various theme decks. Anyone who has unboxed a copy of any of the legendary games knows what I'm talking about here for the other side of things. Nice thick cardboard token, surprisingly thick, featuring the best design money I've seen in a board game that isn't metal. There's even a two-sided board made to work for if everyone's sitting on the same time at the table or on opposite sides, which I thought was a neat bonus, and some amazing reference material and player aids, not only including large rule summaries and icon references, but also cards that you can also use to take up even less room, summarizing the end game scoring as well. Big thumbs up for these summaries and player ability or player tools. There's even a box insert included designed to hold sleeve cards for those of you who care. Now, the quality on this is top notch. It actually exceeded my expectations. My only complaint about all this, though, is there's no real place to put all the tokens, the cardboard stuff, the money, the first player token, the mesmerism tokens and other stuff that comes in the game, the randomizers. Now, there are baggies included, which is great, but there's no real spot to put this stuff in the insert. Now, there is a trough in the middle, but it won't fit all the coins, for example. For now, it works because the spots for cards, there are is four empty spots at this point. So that's great. I can just bag that stuff and throw it in the empty spots. But I know the first expansion for this game has four more decks, and I would want to put those decks into those spots. And I honestly have no idea how I'm going to fit everything into one box because of that. If all the card slots are filled with cards, where do all these tokens go? Yeah, unfortunately, that seems to be a real problem in games. I know I was talking about it with a game I, uh, I discussed uh, the other night where, you know, everyone puts thinks about the cards and thinks about the miniatures and the map tiles, but all the little bits kind of get forgotten yeah. about. No, I totally agree. Now, another thing of note is my copy of this game obviously wasn't the first printing because it included a small pack of replacement cards. Now, this is something I do appreciate Good Games Publishing for doing. With every new printing of Funfair they or, and Unfair, sorry, or every new printing of Unfair, they've updated this pack of cards, fixing some minor issues. My pack happened to note that it was the second pack. This just fixes balance issues and things people complained about or things they found editing issues. Now, we're not reviewing it here today, but I did notice the expansion included the exact same pack of reports replacement cards so if you did get like a first printing of unfair if you buy the expansion you'll get this it's not like you need to rush out and i am sure if you contact good games publishing there's a way to just get these cards somehow i didn't look into it myself all right well now that we have a good idea of the stuff you get in the box how do we use all of these cards and tokens so the first step in playing a game of unfair is deciding which theme deck to use each game requires the use of one deck per player now in the base game there are six different theme decks you have gangster ninja vampire robot jungle and pirate now the rule book does include some suggestions on which decks to use for your first few games and i fully agree with them the decks are not 
all equal as far as learning how to play or difficult to use. Now, to help you pick, each of these themed decks includes a reference card at the start of it, indicating any special rules changes required when using it, as well as this little rating system going from one to five over four different elements. Uh, attraction size, blueprints, coins, and unfairness. So if you really like building tall rides, there's, you probably want, in particular, you want probably the uh, the jungle deck or the pirate deck. If you're all about collecting coins, you kind of want the gangster deck and so on. Now, to be interested, to be clear you don't have to just play so if you if you add the the gangster deck and someone else adds the vampire deck and someone else adds the robot deck you're not mm -hmm. just trying to build a specifically gangster theme park yes you're mixing and matching all of these to try and come up with the best park overall mm -hmm. from the available decks yeah this is more similar to the the board game smash up uh it's where you're taking two decks and you're going to smash them together. But instead of everyone picking their own deck, you're picking the decks that are in play for that game. So even though you picked robots, you, you're not playing the robot deck. It's just one of the decks that's used. Now, what you are going to do when you do each have your own deck is you're going to combine them all. The way you do this is you sort them by their card backs. They did a great job on designing this, so everything's a different color. You're going to mix and shuffle all the cards of the same backs together. You're then going to build the city deck. This is going to feature four fun fair city cards and four unfair city cards. Each player also is going to get two random showcase cards and five random park cards. All the other decks are just shuffled and placed on the board face down. There is a market that is in play. I think it's a six card market. I could be wrong. It might be eight. Sorry, I should have checked that. Uh, you're going to put a bunch of face up cards from the park deck into that market. And I have to say, this game is deceptively simple to play. One thing that should be noted is you really do need to make sure that everyone's paying attention to turn order and, mm. and making sure that all the steps are followed. Now, luckily, they do have those reference cards, so it's not hard for someone to keep that. But if you do get playing quickly, we have noticed that it is easy to sometimes yeah. do something a little bit out of order. And unfortunately, depending on what decks are in play, that can matter. Yes, the timing can be important. Once I get into the a description or overview of play, I'll, I'll explain all the different steps, but it is easy to forget them, especially the first three steps of the game. Things can end up out of order. Now, the next thing you're going to do, you've got picked your decks, you're ready to play, is you have to decide if you want to use a game changer. Game changers are a small deck of cards that come with the game that each can significantly change the way your upcoming game of unfair plays. Now, the rule book and I suggest you start with the first date game changer. Use that for your first game. What that has you do is remove two unfair city cards from the bottom of the city deck, making the game shorter and less nasty. Remove the showcase cards altogether so you don't have to worry about them. And then remove all difficult and insane level blueprint cards. Don't even worry about those. Now, other game changer cards include really cool things like the World Peace Game Changer where you can't use event or park abilities to affect other players. This is great for groups who dig the game, but don't like to take that aspects. There's even the school vacation game changer that makes unfair a kid's game. It removes everything but the park cards and changes the game to be a race to see who can build five rides with at least 15 stars on it. Now, notably, the expansions also add game changers mm -hmm. as well. And there are also other promo game changers uh, out there in the world to collect as well, if you'd like. And for those of you who don't want to go shopping around for that, there is a full card list on uh, Good Games Publishing website. And you can just read the game changers off there. Now, for the rest of this overview, though, I'm just going to assume you're not using game changers. We're going to take them out and I'm going to teach the base game. Just realize that some of these things may have been changed by using one of those game changers. Now, the last thing you're going to do now that you've got everything decided is everyone's going to take 20 coins from the bank. They're going to place their main gate card in front of them. And that is your first card in your tableau. That represents your, 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 your thing just open and it's a gate. <laughs> That's it. Now, a game of unfair is played over eight rounds, which are broken into a number of phases, as we mentioned earlier. Now, every round starts with all players drawing an event card. Nope, they just draw it at this point. Draw it, read it, see what it does. But you don't get to use it yet. Then you're going to draw a city card from the city deck. Now, I mentioned this already, but the first half of the game, these are fun fair city cards. They're all happy things. They're all beneficial. They're all good things. You get extra money. You get to play extra cards. When you draft cards, you get bonuses. It, it, it's all great stuff to help you get building your part. 
The second half of the game, though, these switch over to unfair city cards that can be devastating with their effects. They can just ruin your parks. Now, another aspect of the game is the round you swap between funfair to unfair, four rounds in a standard game. You also end up closing the blueprint market. And there's actually a card there that's put in the deck to remind you to do this. More about blueprints in a little bit. So it's really interesting how, while this game is cutthroat, and from turn one, you can start attacking and, and, and working against your other players. But the actual game itself starts off trying to help you and build yep. you up before it, too, starts trying to beat you down. Yes. Now, after resolving that city card, everyone gets a chance to play event cards. Now, each event card split into two options, top and bottom. Now, in general, there are exceptions. The top is something that will benefit you, whereas the bottom is something you can do to your opponents. Now, each of these adversarial cards have an attack type. So it'll say it's an intrusion or it's a, I can't remember the types off my head. Now, interestingly, some of the events also include ways to block these various attack types. Now, these defensive cards can also be used to block some of those nasty, unfair city events as well. So there is a reason to hold on to these possibly. Now, this is more than I can cover here. There are a ton of events in the game each with different varieties and themes and each different theme deck has its own events. I, like there's no way I can cover them all. They just do all kinds of things. Um, some of the effects include earning extra guests or money, letting you upgrade your stuff cheaply, recovering cards from the discard pile, drawing additional cards and nasty things like closing your opponent's attractions or destroying their upgrades. There's also a few cards that let you take additional turns. And to be fair, because of these event cards that you get every turn ha having defensive natures on them, if you would prefer to play a less attack and, and less take that game, you do have the option in many cases, and again, this is, is dependent on what comes up and what you're dealt, but you can hold on to a bunch of defensive cards and try mm -hmm. and just fend off other people while you're playing your own game. So even if you're stuck at a table with some real take that killers... <laughs> You can, you can sort of hold your own depending on how you play those event cards. Now, players continue to play events. You play event, you play event, you play event, and then until, until everyone passes in order. Note, if you do pass and someone else plays an event, you can jump back in. In addition to the event cards, there are some part cards that will have events on them as well, especially your showcase cards, but we'll get into those in a little bit. Because next, we move on to the park phase. This is the meat of the game. This is where players are going to be building their parks. Now, the park phase is broken into four park steps, and each player is going to get to take one action and then move to the next player, the next player, the next player, until you get back to you, and then you move into the next step. Now, every round, everyone's going to get to do three of these. You're going to take three park steps for sure. There is a fourth park step, but that's only available after players play specific events. And I think one of the showcase cards can also give you extra actions. But in general, everyone's going to take three actions, one action at a time. Maybe someone will get a fourth. Now, each park step, You've got a few choices. The first is take. Draw two cards from one of the decks and keep one. That could be the event deck, the park deck, or the blueprint deck. Or discard a park card to draw five. Now, I've already talked about event cards. I don't think I have to cover those in your hand. Again, they do go into your hand. They count for the hand limit at the end of the turn. Park cards are, are the majority of the game. These are what you use to build your park, and they feature attractions, upgrades, and resources. Now, each card's going to have a cost on it. It's going to list if it's worth any victory points at the end of the game. And it's going to show a star value, which could be nothing. The star value of the cards in your park determine how exciting your park is and how many vests will come visit it, which in turn will generate you some income. Now, attractions and upgrades also have a number of icons on them, showing whether it's a thrill ride or it's a leisure ride or if it's a feature upgrade or if it's a, a park upgrade. You're going to get points at the end of the game by adding up the total number of icons on each of your attractions, including all of the upgrades on. Them. And it's fun to say as well to sort of talk about things as you're building them. So mm -hmm. I'm building the gangster uh, old olden days themed car ride with a jungle twist and, uh, you know, bathrooms and a coat check. Yep. <laughs> No, you cannot put air conditioning on a thrill ride. That's one of the rules in the game. 
Now, blueprint cards, I mentioned these a couple times. These are all about end game scoring. Each card lists a basic park requirement on it. These include things like having specific types of attractions or having attractions with specific types of upgrades or having all your attractions at a specific size, etc. Now, in addition, some of the blueprints also have a bonus section. Now, this bonus section can only be scored if you complete the top, if you complete the, the basic requirement. At the end of the game, you're going to get points for all your completed basics and any bonuses that match your park, but you'll lose 10 points per card if you weren't at least able to complete the basic requirement. Now, each blueprint does list a difficulty rating on it, and it's based on how hard the requirement should be to complete. And it's strongly suggested to not take a blueprint, even if it says easy, if you don't at least have the attraction types needed to complete it, either in your park or in your hand. And I gotta, I point this out to everyone who plays and someone who's a new player always messes this up. It says easy though. And I'm like, yeah, well, it's only easy if you had the theater to start with, for example. Now, again, remember halfway through the game, the blueprint deck does close. Now, interestingly, you won't get to buy blueprints with this take action, but you can still earn them through events and park cards. Now, interestingly, this is the one part of the game that does seriously benefit from system mastery. Mm -hmm. uh, what a lot of players recommend is having or near you or knowing a, the card list available, because there's a good chance that if, even if you do have one of the cards to start with, you may not be able to complete that depending on yeah. what other players have already played or have in their hands. Yes. The next potential action you can be taking on your park step is to build something. Pay the cost shown on a card and put it in your tableau. Interestingly, this card can come from your hand or direct from the market. Attractions are your rides type of things or your, your, your showcases, your hotels, the things people come to your park to see. They go to the right of your gate and you can have a maximum of five of them in your park total. The other types of cards are staff and resources. They go to the left, and there's no limit to how many staff or resources you can have. Now, upgrades are placed onto attractions. Now, some of these cards are also going to have effects when you build them, including the ability to draft cards from the market, build additional cards, or sometimes get a discount on something. In general, though, no attraction can have more than one copy of a specific upgrade. You can't have comfortable seating twice. Uh, an exception to this are the quality upgrades you can have multiples of. And that should be noted because I've messed that one up a number of times. Think always assuming that you can't put them on there because nothing else you can duplicate on your rides. As far as I know, the, the quality ones do clearly state on the card that you can have multiple of them. Right. They're the only ones I remember noticing, but there may be more than quality upgrades. So I don't want to say definitively it's only quality upgrades. There's a lot of cards out there. <laughs> yes. Now, in addition to this, once per game, you have the option to build one of your showcase cards. These are super expensive attraction cards that have super powerful asymmetric abilities and a high star count. So they're great for getting guests to your park. Now, you can't build one of these until your park has at least five stars from other stuff already. So there's no play in one of these the first round of the game. Now, at any time, you also have the option going, forget it. I'm not going to build either of these showcases, remove them from the game, and earn 10 bucks, 10 coins. And that can be big. Now, speaking of money, if at any time you don't have enough money to pay for something, you can always take out a loan. Doesn't cost you an action, doesn't take a turn. Each loan you take instantly gives you five coins for whatever you need it for but that's going to cost you 10 victory points at the end of the game. Each player can take out a maximum of four loans in a single game. Uh, interestingly, these can make a huge difference. If you are lucky enough to get a card combination that means you do not have to take loans, uh, it can massively swing the mm -hmm. game because generally speaking, you do have to take a loan at some point during the game. Yeah. Uh, it's expected, but there are certain combinations that will allow you to avoid that and that can really, really allow you to step for a step up. There's also the opposite side of that, where I have seen a player take four, four loans the second turn of the game to get their showcase and to play three rounds before anyone else. And losing 40 points in the game meant nothing compared to the ability to print money for the rest of the game. Yep. In, a, in a specific game we played with a gangster theme. Now, another option is demolishing. Uh, remove a card from your park. Now, you might want to do this for... Uh, a couple reasons like to fulfill a specific blueprint 
or you might have put down like a low scoring attraction without much on it and you want to replace it with a bigger one or when using the expansion you might want to try to complete a panorama if you remove an attraction though all the upgrades on it are lost so most times you're either going to remove an empty one or you're just going to remove uh specific upgrades that you no longer want now, another option is loose change. I think this one's hilarious thematically. Uh, this represents you scrounging around your park looking for chains that fell out of people's pockets on your rides. Mechanically, get one coin per open attraction you have. Because someone always forgets to check their pockets before getting on your coaster. Mm -hmm. Now, play continues with every player completing one park step action until all park steps are complete. Then you enter the guest phase. This is kind of an upkeep phase. Here, players add up the star value of all the cards in their park, skipping over anything that's closed. Now, each park can hold 15 people, which I think represents 15,000 people or something. It doesn't matter. It's abstract. Now, certain park cards can improve that. But in general, your park capacity is 15. You're going to collect income based on your total star value, but it's capped by that capacity. So even if you have 20 star value of an attractions and upgrades, you're still only going to earn 15 income if you're at the basic park size. This takes a bit for some people to catch. Now, players will also receive additional money for what are called tickets. Some of the park cards have this little ticket symbol on them, and it's a way to earn additional money. There's a number of these in each deck, including things like costume characters, photographers, face painting booths, and so on. Uh, there's the casino and the gambler deck where you roll 2d6 and get that much money. Now, this ticket income, though, is on top of what you earn for the stars. Absolutely. And again, this is one of those things where if you if it sets up right, you can avoid those loans and go all in mm -hmm. really uh, well on money or someone else has got them and you're in the in hawk for uh, a few yes. victory points. Now, the final phase of each round is the cleanup phase. Uh, this is pretty simple. Clear the market, replace it with new cards, pinned events go away. So events that were in play for the whole turn go away. Uh, if your, any of your rides were closed, you get to open them by flipping the cards back over. Uh, you're then going to discount down to five cards if you have more than five. And that includes just park and event cards. Things like your showcase and your blueprints don't count. Then the start player moves to the next person clockwise. Now, the game continues until that city deck runs out in a standard game eight rounds. At this point, there is end game scoring. Now, while the game does include a score pad and even a pencil with an eraser on it, I strongly recommend just leaving that in the box or maybe making room to put the coins in the middle and just grab the unfair scoring app. Uh, this was created by the publisher and is great for doing all the math for you. But better than that, more importantly to me, is it also tracks what factions got played and how that affected the game. And they, like the total score, all the players got, how many players are and what factions were in play. This is the data that Good Games Publishing uses to update and modify cards in order to keep the game balanced as they add more factions to the game. It's actually really quite interesting how involved Good Games Publishing is with this game. Uh, mm. This is uh, another living game in very many ways. Uh, and it is certainly worth going if you are a player of the game or even interested in playing the game checking out unfair-game.com mm -hmm. uh where you can even find print and play to give that yes. game a try yep now during scoring you're awarded points for a few different things i'm not going to go into full details here but first is your attraction size you're going to count up the icons the more icons you have the more points you have pretty simple and it does ramp up so like uh, going from two to three is not as big as going from 13 to 14 for example you're then going to score all your blueprint points cards again getting points for the completed ones and losing points for the incomplete ones importantly and this is something missed by a lot of players is you get one point for every two coins you have at the end of the game this can swing the game if someone might their park might look mediocre but if they've been raking in money all the time they could take the game just from that note this does happen after the last guest step so you are going to get your last round's income before you get these points Next, you're going to get points for any cards on your tableau that have victory points on them. Most of these tend to be staff cards, but there are some park cards that have some end game scoring and some interesting showcases like that do stuff like bury cards under them for end game scoring. Finally, you lose points for those loans you took. Wah, wah. The player, it's player with most points, the Euro game. Ties, I want to get into because I like these. Ties are broken by having the most blueprints. Then the most coins. Then I dig this. Then it goes to who is wearing the most unfair merch. I like that. Like that's just smart thinking right there. Good games publishing. And then the final tiebreaker being a game of rock, paper, scissors. 
being unfair, there are no friendly ties. You got to figure out who wins at some point. There was a great uh, uh, meme going around Twitter the other day where at the Olympics, the two greatest athletes in the world will share a gold medal. But if you and I tie in a board game, it's all going. It's all. Oh, yeah. (laughs) No one likes ties. You all share a victory. Now that we've got a good idea of how to play, let's move on to our thoughts on Unfair from Good Games Publishing. All right, so first off, I'm a little disappointed I didn't get into this game when it came out. Like, there was buzz that sounded neat, but I don't know, building a theme park sounds kind of cool. I I, I just, I, I kind of wish I jumped in in 2017. That would have been neat. But I kind of am glad I didn't because I got to play Fun Fair first. I really like Fun Fair. You can check out my review. I, it was a pretty glowing review. I don't even know if I had anything bad to say about it. It was, oh, the, the insert was terrible. Like there was no way to organize a car. I remember that now. It's easy to learn. It's quick, a ton of fun. This was the perfect introduction to this set of card collecting tableau building mechanics that are basically the same in Unfair. Like Unfair is very similar to Fun Fair. You've got all of the same gameplay elements that we loved in Fun Fair, but more. And I'm not just talking about the fact it's nasty and there's punitive city cards and take that elements. There's just more going on in Unfair than there was in Fun Fair. Yeah, I have to say, I really enjoyed Fun Fair. It was a, a fun game. Mm-hmm. But having played Unfair, uh, while I enjoy the fact that I learned through Fun Fair, I have mm-hmm. no interest in playing Fun Fair again. Uh, I go. like Unfair. Uh, and it is, it's one of those take that games that I, it breaks the rule. I like <laughs> this game again, because there are so many options that also include defensive options Yes. so that if you are worried and, uh, about things, you can plan to minimize or try and minimize the take that aspect, yep. uh, or just go all in and, you know, leave yourself wide open <laughs> by attacking everyone else. Yeah. And just for people who may be watching this as our first ever review, Sean does not generally like take that game. Games would take that elements at all. He would much rather like he's all for competitive games, but the take that stab you in the back generally is a turnoff right from the start. Yeah. So one of the things that's totally new and unfair is the events. There are no events in Funfair. There's nothing like it. And I got to say, it sounds simple. Like draw an event card, play an event card. There's a lot more to it than that. This system adds a lot of the depth to the game. For one, this is another resource you have to manage. And it's something else you have to worry about. But even when drawing cards, both games are games where you never have enough cards. You never have enough stuff in your hand. And now I can draw more cards, but now I might also want to draw an event. And then you get to see some of the huge ones, like double the number of people who visit your park this turn. You're like, oh, but it's also a card I could use to close this. And do I use it to benefit me or do I hurt you or do I save it so you can't hurt me later? Oh, it's just such a a great decision space added to the game through those event cards. Yeah. One of the things about Unfair is while it is a take that game, It's not a uh, willful destruction game. It's not a go out and beat on the other player game, because if you do that, you have now left yourself completely vulnerable to being destroyed by because those event cards are both the attack and the defend. Mm -hmm. So if you just go full on attack, you may well be in trouble (laughs) when uh, as the turns progress. Now, the other area that increases the depth here is the money, the whole money system. So in Funfair, there's a whole system where like outside investors want you to build your showcase and give you money. No, no, none of that here. Uh, What you've got here are the loans. Uh, The the loans are a huge part of the game that you can take a loan anytime, but at a significant end game penalty. And the fact that you even have two showcases is awesome. I can build one or this one or neither just to get 10 bucks. And then there's the, the more themes, right? There, there's six different themes and sifter decks, more things in them. Um, the variability of the different city cards, the fact there are fun, fair city cards and unfair city cards. Uh, the complexity of the blueprints is higher. Uh, it's now an eight round game instead of a six round game. Like all of this just makes for a longer, more complex game. Yes. Now, whereas fun fair is a light family weight game, all fun about building a park. This is a significantly heavier game that in my opinion is in the higher end of what i would consider a medium weight euro game 
like edging towards that heavy. Like if you add it, if you add all the complexity of all the decks, I almost wonder if it steps up, but the actual gameplay is not difficult. Yeah. So uh, for BGG weights, you're looking at a 2.13 for Funfair while you jump up to a 2.72 for unfair. So you've yeah. crossed over that 2.5 mark, which is always yeah, which our, is our, medium, our dividing, yeah, that... uh, dividing line there. Uh, and realistically, I mean, you're looking at almost the difference between a two and a three, two and a three at that point. Yeah. Once you, once you start ignoring the, the fluffiness mm -hmm. in the math. Now what I dig is that everything I loved about fun fair is still there. That's awesome. Like I, I have that same game experience here in a different box with more to it. And that's awesome. As someone who prefers heavier games, I love all the added complexity and decision points. There's more to think about. There's more options every turn. And that's great for me and the people I usually play with. I like the longer game length. I dig the event system. I love the hard decision of deciding whether or not to take a loan. Or more so in my case, I love tempting my opponents to take as many loans as they can. Well, what do you mean you can't afford that? You just got to take out a loan. Come on. I dig how each of the different theme decks brings a different feel to the game. Now, what I chose not to focus on here is what we thought of each of the six decks, but I have played with each of them at least two times each, as well as multiple different combinations. And they're all fun in their own way, and they all change the game. I, I dig how they interact with each other. And man, some of them get even more powerful when combined with others. Like if you're looking for coins and quality upgrades, throw the jungle and the pirate deck together. If you're really looking to kind of stay on the down low and do your own thing, get that gangster deck in play because it's got some unique cards in, right? Like I dig the different feels. Yeah, there's such a such a variety between the things. Like I still haven't played Ninja yet, but I know Ninja is oh, a really nasty, take that. <laughs> a really wow. nasty uh, deck that that when it, when it comes out there. Whereas you know your jungle and your gangster, while gangster sounds really take that, it actually has some nice defensive aspects. Yeah. You know? Yeah, the, the wad of cash card is so useful from that deck. Now, another aspect I love about both these fair games is the fact, something Sean mentioned earlier, while you're playing the game, there's there's almost a storytelling experience. Now, maybe that's because I tend to play it with people who are also role players, um, but it's always been an aspect of every game I play. Like maybe, yes, physically, I added the ninja theme card and I tucked it under my tiger experience leisure ride. But what I'm telling the other players at the time is, well, you know, my park's mostly owned by gangsters, right? So what the trick is, there aren't tigers. There's no tigers on this ride at all. We just charge people to go on the ride and tell them they're rare ninja tigers. They're impossible to spot. And every time we ride the ride, some dupe gets off going, oh, I saw a tiger. And then some kid's like, well, I saw two. And that just keeps them coming. Those are the kind of stories I love telling in a game of unfair. There's a sucker born every minute. It's... <laughs> Now, one of the other things I love finding in a board game is the feeling of building something. Games that feature this leave me feeling satisfied with my accomplishment at the end of the game, regardless if I came in first or last place. Now, we just talked about this in our Tapestry review earlier today, and that's something that ties these two games together for me. This is another game that has that effect, similar to, say, Terraforming Mars. Unfair has that. I built a park. Look at it. Isn't it awesome? Who cares who won? And yes, Funfair had that, but I find it more rewarding. It's even more so in Unfair. Absolutely. Now this leaves us with the elephant pen in the theme park the take that part of this game, the nastiness. This is by far the most controversial aspect of Unfair and something people disliked enough that Good Games Publishing decided to make a more friendly version of the game and created Funfair. There are enough people out there asking for it. They made a different game to make it more friendly. Now for me, I don't mind some take that. And I actually have no problem at all with the negative effects from that city deck that impacts everyone. To me, that's perfectly fine. I don't, I don't mind the game beating me up, but the take that natural in this game is a bit much. Um, some of the things you can do to each other are just nasty. Many of the event cards feature devastating effects that if you don't defend against them, can ruin your strategy, your long-time strategy. And that's where it can be extremely frustrating. When you have been working for five turns to get this difficult blueprint done, just to have that taken away from you with nothing you can do about it. That can be extremely frustrating. Yeah, so interestingly, one thing I would definitely recommend to players is, again, checking out their website. Because one of the things they actually offer on their website is a strategy guide. 
And now this is actually something that's beneficial to both teachers of the game and players of the game, because they talk at the beginning of that strategy guide about customizing the game for your friends, for your table, and how to sort of think about the game for your table versus just, you know, throwing mm -hmm. it out there. So again, you've got these game changers that allow you to balance and shift things for your table, but then they also get into strategy, both uh, overall through the game and for individual decks to help you mm -hmm. learn a little bit more about how to balance things so that you're not that one schmuck who doesn't know anything about the game and is just getting pounded on pounded by vampires up. and ninjas left and right. Yeah, very fair points. Going back to the first time I played it. So the first time we broke out Unfair, we played Funfair, loved it. We played it multiple times. Big fan of Funfair. We pull out Unfair. It's just Deanna and I. It was a date night. Um, we're playing and I, I, it went terrible. Like the Deanna had saved up two events for the last two rounds of the game, hit me with both of them, one turn after another that undid all of the work I did for the entire game. Everything I had worked towards was taken away with nothing I could do. My whole goal was to complete these two difficult blueprints that would have got me over 60 points by the end of the game. At that point, I was like, I don't like this game at all. Like that, that wasn't fun. Like I did all this work. I built this thing just to have it taken away with nothing I could do. Thankfully, I was willing to give the game another chance. While I still would say, don't play this game on date night due to potential hard feelings. Yeah, that, that can still happen. You don't, you know, it's a date night. You're supposed to cuddle after. And I'm like, I want nothing to do. You ruined my part. You don't want that to happen. I have learned there are many ways to mitigate that nastiness. And Sean's already mentioned a few of them earlier in the show and as we've been going. And a lot of them has to do with that system mastery and learning the card decks, at which could come from the website or could come from just knowing the cards. Like knowing the two cards Deanna used to destroy me are in the deck when those two themes in play that is in my head now. Every time I play the game, if I know those two themes are in play, I know that that might happen so I can plan for it. This could be to keep defensive cards. It could be to build contingencies. It could be to make sure to hold on a card that lets me rearrange stuff, whatever it happens to be. I also learned uh, the, the hard lesson of diversify your blueprints. Make sure you get a couple of sure things instead of just going for the two big long shots and planning your entire strategy on that. Knowing what nastiness is out there can help you prepare for it. If not, outright prevent it. And that is the big part of enjoying unfair. Like what I actually suggest, uh, you could do it on the website, but before you start playing is pass the decks around. Like everyone pick the decks, look through everyone's different deck and look through each of the decks. So, you know, what, get a heads up on what's coming and you will note there are repetitions. Like the same events are in not like, it's not like the events in the pirate deck are completely unique. And the ones in the gangster are completely unique. There probably are some unique events, but like you're going to start seeing the same ones. You're like, yeah, yeah, I know that one. I know that one. I know that one. You might want to look through each of the decks first. And possibly more importantly, you may want to see how many of each card are in the deck because then you know that rushing for that blueprint that requires you to have a car chase with a gangster scene on it is completely impossible because there's only two in the decks and both are already in play. Not knowing that, you might be spending your entire game cycling through a deck to find something that's not there. Yeah, there's there's a really good reason that one of the features you find in the files list for BGG for Unfair is various people coming up with card lists and yeah. why there is a card list on the Unfair mm -hmm. game website. Having a card list isn't cheating. It's kind of recommended. Yeah. <laughs> now, besides learning the cards, right, using a card list, there is an even easier way to get rid of this nastiness. And those are the game changer cards. I don't get people's aversion to using these. Like these aren't house rules. This isn't cheating. This isn't stuff people made up at home. These are official rule variants the designer felt were important to include because they recognize the game won't appeal to everyone. Don't be afraid to use these game changers. They could be the key for making unfair a good game or even a frustrating game to a great game for your personal game group. They also work great for making the game accessible to less experienced players, including even kids, and be able to make things more difficult for experienced players. Like if you've got a group of heavy gamers that like long-term strategy, throw in the advanced planning game changer. What happens with that is everyone gets five blueprints at the start of the game and gets to pick one to keep. So right from turn one, you have something to work towards. If you love money coming in and being able to build all kinds of things, 
And you want asymmetry right from the start. You want to have a special power and feel feel different from everyone else. Use the grand opening game changer. Player to your left picks one of your showcases, starts in play, built for free. The other thing that may not be obvious, and I figure it's probably worth mentioning, is you can mix and match these. You could throw down both of those. You can have the grand opening game changer and the uh, the blueprint one, which may make those blueprints that require you to have a specific showcase more useful. Because I got to admit, those ones kind of frustrate me. I, I have to say, uh, if you if you glance at the reviews on Unfair, there's a huge swing in there. And what I notice is the majority of those one, two, and three ratings have only ever played the game once. Yeah. They don't understand. I hated it playing it once. They don't understand the game. This game can never be a good one and done game. Uh, You are going to, someone who's going to walk away from from their first play of this, disappointed. Uh, someone if they if they if they crush the other players may love the game after their first play, <laughs> but everyone else may hate it, and and that's because there are again so many options with the game changers and things that really mm-hmm. shift how this feels and and can adjust the game for your table and your preferences. Yes. So overall, I still think fun fair. I'm going to continue to use it. I know Sean said he won't play it anymore, but you know what? It's going to be great for introducing new players to this system. It's actually going to be great for casual game nights for going out. Uh, we're at easy mode locally here in where people tend to have a couple adult beverages while they're playing. I'm probably going to, I'm probably going to keep around for that though. I have grown to enjoy unfair more. Again, I hated the first game. Like I had a negative experience my first play, but I've learned that most of the nastiness in this game can be mitigated through honestly good play, like proper play, or just remove it. If you don't like that, use those game changers. I love the feeling of accomplish it. I get at the end of every game, looking at the park I build. I enjoy the stories that get told at the table, me and Deanna competing over who had the best uh, tiger thing was hilarious. The one game where we just kept trying to out upgrade the one ride for no point reason, just because we were telling a good story. I also greatly appreciate the dials on this game. I love the fact that I can adjust it to make it more appealing when playing with different groups, ranging from quick games to my kids to cutthroat games with heavy gamers. I really do dig this game. I think there's a lot of fun to be had, even at the unfair. And this is all without any of the expansions that exist or are already announced. So if you're an experienced gamer who digs engine building board games, especially card driven ones, I strongly suggest checking out Unfair. Now, again, if you're an experienced gamer, you can probably even jump right to this and skip over Funfair. Now, if you played Funfair and enjoy it and are kind of like, oh, I wish there was a bit more going on, do it, buy it, pick up Unfair. It's well worth it. Now, even if you don't like to take that, if you're like, oh, I love Funfair, I want more, but I don't want to take that realize that there are those dials. There are the cards you can do when there are things that can make the game more similar to Funfair and basically turn it into Funfair with more options. Now for everyone else, I'd say don't pick this up. As I mentioned earlier, seek out and try Funfair first. It really is a better gateway to this card-driven park building system that Good Games Publishing has established here. It is a ton of fun on its own. Again, I own both games. I fully expect both to hit the table for years to come. Now, Funfair is going to come out at public play and casual game events, whereas Unfair is going to be my game of choice for playing with regulars and my game group are here at home. And again, if you are playing Unfair, remember that it is not that game that you should judge off your very first play. Mm -hmm. Give it a couple of tries. There are so many options. You cannot, you just cannot fairly judge this game on a single play. Now, finally, unlike many games out there on the market, if you do want to try Funfair or Unfair, you don't have to buy the game. You don't even have to go find a friend that's got a copy or go to a local game store with a demo copy. You can get a print and play version of both games online completely free, or you can play them online through heavily scripted tabletop simulator mods. Yes, I know tabletop simulator is not free, but you can wait for it to be on sale and it's about 10 bucks. Split that with your game group and then you don't have to worry about not being able to play in person anymore. Well, I will say Tabletop Simulator is not going to teach you how to play the game. It's just a tool that's there. You need someone who have read the rules and knows what they're doing. It is a great digital implementation of both games. And it does the scoring for you. Yes. 
Well, that's it for our look at Unfair from Good Games Publishing. I invite you to read more about this game in the review section of the blog over at tabletopbellhop.com. Now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Jeff Soups. Thanks, Jeff. Kevin Renault, Thanks, Tech. Timothy Smith. Thanks, Timothy. Cat and Tori. Great seeing you guys in most gaming picks again. William Fisher. Thank you. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end and we're going to have to lock the front doors. So the doors to the lobby are closed. You can always find us all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com, find our podcast on your podcatcher of choice, and sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, links down below. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping your bellhops at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For the lobbyists, thanks for joining us. Be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show and stop by Sundays for brunch. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.